And all the consultant staff were sitting on these chairs, uh, chairman of the medical committee told me I could sit down and then the questioning began. Interrogation. <laughs> So Andrew, it's real pleasure to have you and to interview you for ACNR Nottingham Editions on the occasion of publication of your recent book, Mentored by a Madman, The William Burroughs Experiment. Uh, you've written this part memoir, part uh, fantasia, uh, you call it, on how William Burroughs uh, inspired or, or provided direction uh, in various things that you did in your career. So very pleased that you're here and to talk to you today. So we're sitting in the old boardroom of the National Hospital Queen Square. This is a small boutique hospital that was opened in 1860. It became a cradle for British neurology. If the disease involves both substantia nigra, there is difficulty in correcting posture. This hospital has always reminded me of a, a men's club in a way, um, the, the way it was laid out and everything. And of course, it, it was a men's club up until 1980, so we had to wait until 1980 to have the first female consultant neurologist appointed. For me, this room has bittersweet memories. In fact, sometimes when I come in here still, I get a, a tension headache because it's the place where I was interviewed on the 5th of October 1982 uh, for the consultant post which I held up until my retirement from the NHS. As a teenager I was very interested in natural history, particularly botany, and I joined the Leeds Naturalist Club and this was of great value to me because it put me in touch with learned individuals uh, who inspired me really to be meticulous in uh, recording what I saw in the Yorkshire countryside, uh, enhanced my powers of, of, of observation. And in fact at that time I really wanted to be uh, an Amazon naturalist, to go into the Amazon and bring back rare plants and so on. And my parents sort of slowly directed me towards medicine and I'm very grateful to them for doing that. In retrospect, I wasn't at the time that they did it. I was quite sort of angry because I didn't really want to be a doctor. Then I got a, accepted for the Royal London Medical College in Whitechapel. My teachers were very inspirational. So I, I think that it was at that time that I kind of started to toy with the idea of Neurology might be something that would suit my temperament. I, I also like the rational nature of neurology and the, the idea that you could um, deduce the diagnosis by careful listening and taking a history. It's interesting to me how this being the uh, bicentenary of James Parkinson's description of Parkinson's disease, which was coined uh, later by Charcot, malady to Parkinson, um, it's interesting how this paper has still t stood the test of time, which is essentially a case note, case series of a, of a few patients that he's observed. Can you talk about why you think it's st stood the test of time? Well, of course, there the, the were no neurologists when James Parkinson was around, and he, he always called himself an apothecary surgeon. And I think what, what his genius was is that he was able to link two separate conditions that had been described separately, a, a shake of the hand associated with some curious motor disturbance which he described as a, a failure to respond to the dictates of the will, a poverty of movement. Uh, and he linked that with a flexed, shuffling posture uh, through his observations in the streets. So he was a, an early field neurologist in a way. J James Parkinson wrote his essay in the hope that the great anatomists of his day uh, would try to find the lesion, which he, Parkinson speculated that it was in the upper cervical cord and the lower medulla, and he wasn't that far out actually, which is amazing. And of course, as you know, Mike, it took a hundred years to find the lesion after Parkinson's description. So it wasn't until Tretiakov in Paris in 1917 that we discovered that the substantia nigra was the lesion. And of course that work stemmed 
from technology, the development of Golgi stains and the microscope and Cajal. I mean, I see that in a way as a kind of alta mirage. You know, the, the, these people are developing these technologies and it's up to us as doctors to use them in a productive way for solving the mysteries of diseases. You know, Francis Bacon talks about the bee get, getting pollen from uh, different flowers and making honey out of that. And that's, that's how I see the, the business of neurology. The, we're not scientists, but we need science to take the best bits out of science. But we need an alchemy, a magic, and that's kind of where Burroughs comes in a little bit with me. In 1972, after house jobs, I took a van de jaar and ended up at La Salpetriere Hospital close to the Jardin des Plantes, where as part of my training, I was taught the value of intuition and instinctive deduction in clinical decision-making. Symptoms were the cries of a suffering brain, and through their intense study, an idea of their cause could be reached. Jean-Martin Charcot, the father of neurology, taught me that nervous disease was very old and immutable. It was only I who would change as I learned to recognize what was formerly imperceptible. I discovered that even the classic nervous diseases like maladie de Parkinson exhibited great diversity in their course, which seemed to render them less implacable. I was acquiring a feel for sickness and an appreciation of its intricacy. We're here in the Queen Square Library. I always found that reading original descriptions was much more helpful for me in remembering disease state. So I used particularly the historical section of this library and would look up the seminal accounts on diseases such as myasthenia gravis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. One of my own particular heroes in neurology is William Gowers, who arguably is the greatest clinical neurologist that ever lived. So this is the case notes. And if you read, if you look at the format of the case notes, you'll see that it's very similar to the way we write today. So to look back at these original case descriptions, knowing what we know now can be very instructive. And one of Gower's secret weapons was that he was a, gr a great supporter of um, the use of shorthand in medicine, so that he was able to record in much more detail um, uh, what was happening at the bedside uh, by taking shorthand notes uh, after he'd interviewed and, and seen patients. And I, I see that uh, really as a... Um, it's comparable to the use of big data and computerized databases today, as an, and it's an incre it was an incredibly powerful tool, and it allowed him to publish what is still uh, known as the Bible here at Queen Square, the, the Manual of the Diseases of the Nervous System. And when we were training our teachers, particularly people like Macdonald Critchley, who I, I got the back end of. He was already an elderly man, but he was still giving uh, teaching courses here. He would tell us, you know, before you rush into print, go and read Gowers. The descriptions in this book are really magnificent, and they, because they're describing phenomena, they don't go out of date. If they've got, these are the consultants. This is William Gowers, Hugh Lings Jackson. There is some possibility that um, uh, Conan Doyle, when he set up practice in uh, his private rooms in Harley Street, may have come to listen to some of Gower's lectures, which were open to local general practitioners, but th this is not verified. But uh, I like to think it might be true, because many of the aphorisms and uh, memorable phrases uh, that Sherlock Holmes used uh, can be found in, in, in Gower's work too. I'm convinced that these murders are only incidental. 
to some larger and more diabolical scheme. That may be, but why the severed fingers? Well, I'm sitting in Hewlings Jackson's chair. Gowers, my legendary hero in neurology, referred to Hewlings Jackson as the master, so it's a great privilege to be sitting here and reading a little bit now about the importance of detective work in diagnosis in neurology. Detective work had become a metaphor for diagnostic acumen and the mysteries that exercised Sherlock Holmes shared some of the rhythms of neurological practice. One day I had planned to teach the second year clinical medical students on a young African boy with myasthenia gravis a disorder that leads to profound weakness of speech, difficulties in swallowing, and a droopy face. Unfortunately, despite asking the nursing staff to make sure Mr. S did not leave the ward, when we arrived at his bed, he was nowhere to be found. Undeterred and anxious to show off my newly acquired skills, I asked the bemused group to tell me what they could deduce about the patient. The crime scene consisted of a spirometer, an instrument used to measure lung capacity, an eye patch, and a large number of personal possessions, including some comic books. After I had listened to their suggestions, it seemed reasonable for me to submit on the basis of the evidence that the patient was young, had double vision and shortness of breath, and had been in the ward for some time to undergo some form of acute treatment. The combination of respiratory problems and double vision in a young person pointed strongly to a primary disorder of the muscles or the junction between the muscles and nerves. Holmes used a process of abductive reasoning to solve crimes and I was now incorporating this into my clinical method. Well, whoever's behind all this thing must be out of his mind. On the contrary, my dear fellow, if my assumptions are correct, this little scheme has behind it the most brilliant and ruthless intellect the world has ever known. We're in the October Gallery, uh, of course, and the October Gallery uh, was opened on the corner of Queen Square where I've worked for most of my working career. They, they specialise in transcultural avant-garde painting movement, so it's nice to be talking about Burroughs here. When the States got too hot for him, he left for Mexico City with uh, Joan Volmer. He was drunk, I think they were all drunk. So she put, she put a glass on the top of her head and Burroughs uh, got his gun out and fired to shoot the glass off. But instead of shooting the glass, the bullet went through her forehead and she died. But he, later he said that he was infected with a, an ugly spirit, which had been responsible for him shooting Joan Volmer. Um, and after that, he um, started writing and seriously, I think. I think he felt that words were responsible for a lot of evil in the world, and that only by transcending language could you correct certain things. So Geissen, uh, met Burroughs in the Beat Hotel in Paris and uh, Burroughs always accredited him as one of the the few geniuses he'd ever encountered and it was collaborations with Geissen that began the cut up and paste technique. An idea that developed around that time was his ideas about the word, well he said the word is a virus Calling all active agents re, calling all active agents re, calling all active re agents calling. The word is now a virus. The flu virus may have once been a healthy lung cell. It is now a parasitic organism that invades and damages the central nervous system. Modern man has lost the option of silence. Try halting subvocal speech. Try to achieve even 10 seconds of inner silence you will encounter a resisting organism that forces you to talk. That organism is the word. And that made me think, of course, in medicine, uh, one of the dangers these days is that we don't keep silent. And the use of silence in healing is enormous. 
A lot of the post-encephalitic patients had very interesting speech disturbances like repetitions, perseverations. When Gerald Stern, my teacher, had given them L-DOPA, some of them developed pressure of speech. Uh, uh, and they couldn't stop talking, so it was like continuous speech, automatic speech. Um, uh, and this was one of the many side effects that meant that the drug couldn't be uh, continued to be used. So when I started to get involved in the therapeutics of Parkinson's disease, we, the, the new drug was bromocryptine. We learnt a lot from the trials with bromocryptine and of course it did enter clinical practice for several years. One thing I think is very bad about current clinical trials where you, many of us, no longer see the data because uh, they've been hijacked by pharma and we, we, we don't get a chance to look at the details of the data is that they are great modern trials hide side effects. This is a pathological specimen to show the abnormality. So there was this kind of environment to test drugs, even potentially dangerous drugs. And at that time, at least at UCH, it was standard practice that if you were trying a new drug, you there was nothing more ethical than to try it on yourself first. Useful palliative remedy in the form of levodopa. So that was my first entry into self-experimentation and ever since then I've tried almost all the drugs that, um, that I've used. Again Burroughs spoke to me because uh, he, he was the arch self-experimenter and in a sense he used his brain as a petri dish. So about seven years ago, I was in a neurology conference in the Amazon region and one of my uh, colleagues suggested to me that I might be interested to try the hallucinogenic drug Yache. And I remembered um, from Doors of a Perception, Aldous Huxley's book that I also read in the 60s, that he had recommended that the people who might benefit most from taking psychedelic drugs um, were university professors because as they became more eminent, they tended to become more rigid and narrow-minded in their outlook. I now know that rational consciousness is parted by the thinnest of films from illusion and dream. Seeing things that are not there can occur in the blind, the bereaved and even in waking dreams. The innate knowledge of the Amazon Indian, assisted by the ritual use of sacred plants, has given me second sight. I understand for the first time how during hurricanes, chair-bound victims of Parkinson's disease can magically override the poltergeist and escape to safety. The plant doctors, through their little doctoritos, little doctors, had shifted my understanding of reality. I now could see into my own mind. When I came back, I started some new experiments, including some actually looking at uh, banisterine, which is the liana that Richard Spruce had identified as um, one of the active ingredients of ayahuasca uh, in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. When I came back from Paris, before I'd done any neurology, uh, formal neurology training, I used to come to the clinical demonstrations that they had at Queen Square. My yeah. teachers were great showmen. Yeah. I mean, they were, and you learned because, I mean, it, of course, sometimes it was showing off, but more, more often it wasn't. It was more just to help you to remember things. Here's my second hero in neurology, MacDonald Critchley. Critchley was very interested in uh, body language and kinesics and the neurology of gestures. I discovered that he'd taken mescaline when he was a junior doctor as an experiment. You know, when I we began to get worried that, you know, my ayahuasca experience had been a bit dodgy, I, I also learned that Weir Mitchell had also taken mescaline and written a lot about mm. mescaline uh, right at the beginning. Sharko had taken hashish. There was this kind of tradition, you know, of, well, I'm using this to justify yes. what I did in a way, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, so long as you do it f f with a sort of experimental mindset. 
I mean, I was obviously greatly honoured to have got a post here at Queen Square. But at the same time, I felt I'd sold out slightly. And I'd now, now I was forced to be a member of the establishment, whether I liked it or not. So as a kind of reaction to that, I did reread Naked Lunch. On earlier times when I'd read it, the apomorphine story hadn't really kind of hit me that much, but I'd actually used apomorphine by that stage in the lab as a, a prototype dopamine agonist, so I knew now that it was a dopamine agonist. And so we were looking for drugs that we could use to complement L-dopa and see if we could reverse the off periods, and of course apomorphine came to mind. And we showed that if you injected subcutaneously apomorphine in a refractory off period, you could switch people on. The patient's now able to walk well with almost no dyskinesia. So this is the structural formula of apomorphine. And this is what I saw in my dream before we decided to um, use apomorphine uh, in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. It's what William Burroughs called the junk vaccine. It began several years after we'd reintroduced apomorphine into clinical practice for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And one day in the Parkinson's clinic at the Middlesex Hospital, a patient came in with his wife and his wife said to me, your wonderful new treatment, apomorphine, has turned my uh, husband into a drug addict, a junkie. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, she's, he's craving for the drug. He's using uh, 20 injections a day of apomorphine. He was seeking out clandestine supplies of medication and behaving in a very, very disruptive and uh, antisocial way. And then I started to present it at meetings and um, it was greeted with um, to total incredulity by neurologists. Nobody believed it at first. They said, you know, I've been using L-dopa and even apomorphine uh, for years and I've never seen a single case of this. Uh, it must be your imagination. This was another obvious intersection with Burroughs. So in Junkie, he wrote, the junkie needs junk like the diabetic needs insulin. Junk creates a deficiency so that the body cannot function without more junk at regular intervals. When I say a habit-forming drug, I mean a drug that alters the endocrine balance of the body in such a way that the body requires that drug in order to function. That kind of made me think that these drugs were permanently altering, even if they were not being taken all the time, the dopaminergic system in a, in a permanent kind of way. The truth is that we don't know the pathways or the pathogenic processes, and yet that there's been too much emphasis on partial scientific evidence in driving research programs. And we know that the pharmaceutical industry are largely driven by profit. I mean, and they've actually almost come out of um, Parkinson's disease. I think we need left field approaches and imaginative approaches. And the, the, the problem is, how can you do that now? Optical microscopy first drew me to the brain's true beauty. Under high power magnification, its silvered nerve cells resemble black leafless trees that have put down arborescent roots in the gray matter. I started in neurology, I was drawn to it by the rational nature of it. But as I went on in neurology, what, what I wanted to get more and more of is rom what I've called the romance of neurology and the, the soulfulness of neurology, which I think was for a time lost. I have a feeling it's coming back. That's been my mission and that's in a way why I wrote this book, partly to inspire young doctors and to go into neurology and try to find a, a source of inspiration outside medicine as well.